Welcome back to Historical Geology. I'm Robert Lopez, your instructor for this course. And today I want to talk about the Paleozoic life history, primarily the invertebrates, which covers here chapter 12. Some of the objectives we'll look at in this chapter, radiation of life. They call this Cambrian explosion. It's more that life developed hard body parts. Those hard body parts were easy to fossilize. And so we see lots of fossils in this Cambrian period. We'll have to talk about marine ecosystems uh, in terms of ecological roles and lifestyles in the ocean to kind of get into a sense of the complexity of these of the ecology during this time. We see that the Cambrian was really a ex time of experimentation where organisms were experimenting with phyla, and phyla really refers to the body type or the body style. And we'll see that bryzoans really developed in the Ordovician and then the Nidarians, which are the, the jelly, small jellies and, and corals, really were in the Neoproterozoic before the Cambrian. Then for the Ordovician, we see uh, really a rapid diversification of life occurred here, probably more so than the Cambrian in terms of new ecological niches opening up uh, due to this transgression of the Tippecanoe Sea. But then obviously, uh, Gondwana starts moving over the South Pole, glaciers advance, sea levels drop, we lose all that shallow shelf environment, and there's a mass extinction during that regression of the Tippecanoe Sea. And then when we look at the Silurian Devonian, we see life bouncing back, and this time we're developing major reefs, and instead of being um, stromatoporoids or archaeocyathids, which are the reef builders over here in the Cambrian and Ordovician, we end up seeing corals start to be the major reef uh, formers in the Devonian and the Permian. Then to the Ordovician, we do see a Devonian mass extinction. And then in the Permian, we see the greatest of all mass extinctions. So we're going to look at these invertebrates. And your book starts off talking about Charles Walcott, who was the director of the Smithsonian uh, in the early 1900s. But as a field paleontologist, he the one, was the one who discovered the, the famous Burgess Shale Formation over in Mount Field, British Columbia. The Burgess Shale is really a, an important geological region that gives us a window into what life was like in this Cambrian period and how there was all this experimentation with phyla or body, body type and trying to fill these new ecological niches that were opening up during this Cambrian and later the Ordovician time. One thing we find in this Burgess Shale is that of this middle Cambrian time is that 60% of the organisms were soft bodied. And that's kind of similar to what we see today. And again, this very complex ecosystem. I was looking at this Cambrian explosion and I went to the UC Berkeley Museum of Paleontology. What they note is that maybe the explosion may be a, a bit of a misnomer uh, because Cambrian life did not evolve in a blink of an eye. And we have, find that Cam the Cambrian was preceded by millions of years of evolution and primarily that Ediacaran fauna, right? So this Ediacaran fauna from 600 to 542 million years ago. And sometimes this Ediacaran fauna is also called the, the, the Vendian time. So this Vendian time corresponds to this Ediacara fauna. So beginning in this Paleozoic era, animals with shells appeared rather quickly an explosion of development or new types of body plans. So remember the body plans are the phyla. But in reality, we already had quite a bit of geologic history and of evolution. And if we look at this little cartoon I have on the side here, so if we look at the Neoproterozoic, many of the modern phyla that we see really diversified before the pre-Cambrian, Cambrian boundary at 542. So you can see there's this diversification that occurs before. So that's where this Ediacaran fauna are coming in here, right? Many animal phyla actually diverged during this Neoproterozoic time, which means that we had a, a, a long history of evolution before this Cambrian explosion. So that's why this may be a, a misnomer right here. So again, these Ediacaran fossils, these Vendian fossils, continue right up to the base of the Cambrian period. The Cambrian explosion had its roots firmly planted in this Neoproterozoic time. So the question is, what triggered the appearance of the hard body parts? So we know that there was snowball earth. And after that snowball earth event, there was a, a dramatic warming, maybe volcanic eruption, uh, somehow warming up the planet. But the cap carbonates, remember the one we have in Death Valley, uh, the noonday dolomite, 
they require those warm tropical waters where the activity of CO2 is low, uh, which means you're not making the carbonic acid and you're allowing that precipitation of calcium carbonate. Remember, a rock composed of calcium carbonate is called limestones. Also, we're seeing more oxygen in the ocean, right? So there's an increase in oxygen levels. Maybe there's an arm race going on. So the reason organisms were developing hard body parts is because they were protecting themselves from predators because we know that, that by the end of this Ediacaran or Vendian time in the Neoproterozoic, we see animals with teeth. So this predation becomes quite prevalent. The prey is developing a defense mechanism. Also, your book mentions these things about Hox genes or homeox genes, and they're really parts of the gene that, that turn on sequences that control the development of different parts of the body. One thing that we do see in the Neoproterozoic, this Ediacaran fauna, we do see that some animals had a chitinous carapace. Remember, a carapace is like the shell of a crab, hard material, but it does fossilize. The Indian animals had spots or small areas of calcium carbonate plates, right? So they're already starting to develop these hard body parts, and maybe they started expanding on them as more, um, more predation occurs, so as a form of defense. By the Cambrian time, we do really start seeing uh, a whole group of new animals. Mostly, they seem to be related to mollusks, like snails or clams, in the early Cambrian, and that's what we call the small shelly fauna. So the small shelly fauna, Tamania fauna, which is 535 to about 520 million years ago, the animals are developing these hard body parts because maybe they need protection against UV radiation, um, having a shell prevents desiccation during low tides. Maybe uh, the, the shells allow for attachment of muscle groups, making the animal get larger over time. And again, protection against predators. So before we look more into the, the Cambrian system, let's look at marine ecosystems here. Ecology is really involves two parts. It's this biotic part, which is the living part, the animals and, and food webs, and then the abiotic part is the non-living part, which is the chemistry, uh, the physics, the geology of the environment. So both of these together make up the environment, which is really the ecosystem or ecology. When we're looking at the marine environment, we're looking at three ecological roles. So this, these are your roles or jobs in the ecosystem. So a producer is said to be a, an autotroph. And troph means to feed. And so they feed themselves. And so a, a producer, autotroph, you can think of this as, as a chemist of life. So they, they synthesize uh, nutrients into organic molecules. So they're taking raw chemical elements like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and making them into carbohydrates, right? So they're the producers, the autotrophs. So obviously the, they're the, the algae, the plants, or maybe archaea, which do a form of chemosynthesis. For the consumer, these are the, the heterotrophs. And heterotrophs means mixed feeders, right? Mixed feeders. So these are either eating producers, plants and algae, or maybe they're eating other consumers. So they're, they could be herbivores or carnivores. Now for the decomposers, you can think of these as uh, the great recyclers of life. Uh, but really, they're also, they're also heterotrophs, except that they're breaking down organic molecules and releasing raw nutrients. So again, decomposers, like decomposing bacteria or filamentous fungi, they're breaking down these organic molecules. So again, they're recyclers of life. Now, when we're looking at these nutrients, remember, nutrients do cycle in ecosystems, right? So these guys will break down the organic molecules they'll have those nutrients, and I call them chomps, for carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, to be used by the producers to make organic molecules. So nutrients cycle in ecosystems. Whereas energy, energy is a one-way flow in an ecosystem. And the energy is either lost to metabolism, lost to heat, lost to entropy. And so think of entropy as maintain your system. So you need energy to maintain your system. And if you're like when you get sick, your system works at getting you making you feel better. And so that requires energy. So energy is lost to that as well. So energy is a one way flow. One interesting thing about this this energy 
in ecosystems, 90% of the energy is lost at each trophic level. So what is a trophic level? So these trophic levels are basically where the organism feeds, remember troph means to feed, where it feeds in the food web or the food chain. So we know that producers, which are the autotrophs, they feed at the first trophic level. They're synthesizing, they're taking raw inorganic carbon and making it in, into organic molecules. Those are producers. Uh, the first order consumer, that eats, they're feeding at the second trophic level and they're feeding on these producers, right? And usually we call these herbivores. However, let's say we had um, a thousand units of energy here. By the time they get to the consumer here, there's only 100 units. So the first order consumer, remember 90% is lost or 10% is transferred. The third trophic level will be the first order carnivore or the second order consumer. And these guys are only getting 10 units. So again, you're noticing that as you go farther on this trophic pyramid, you're, you're seeing less and less energy. That's why there are fewer and fewer organisms at, you know, for example, apex predators, there are a few of them because there's less energy at higher in the trophic level. Finally, the last level would be the, the decomposer. And they're, again, breaking down the organic molecules, releasing the nutrients back into the ecosystem. Now, kind of looking at this idea of synthesis, there are two types of synthesis. In other words, you're, you're fixing carbon into food webs. And one way of doing it is through photosynthesis. So we use photons or plants and algae use photons from the sun. Uh, they combine water and carbon dioxide to produce simple sugars like glucose with a byproduct of oxygen. The other one that occurs is this chemosynthesis, and that really happens like at mid-oceanic ridges that those archaea or microbes that, that take like hydrogen sulfide or metallic sulfides from these black smokers from these mid-oceanic ridge hydrothermal vents combine them with carbon dioxide and oxygen to produce simple sugars here and some other byproducts here. But again, they're fixing inorganic carbon into an organic molecule. So it's really a form of synthesis and it's a base of a food web in this mid-oceanic ridge hydrothermal vent. Lifestyles in the ocean, so how the animal lives and how does it maneuver within its environment, we're gonna have three roles. There's plankton, Necton and benthos. Plankton really is, is Greek for wanderer. Free floater, drifts, weak swimmer. For Necton, these are the strong swimmers. So they're gonna be obviously the fish, tuna, uh, marine mammals in, in our time, but organisms that can swim against the current and can move at their own will. Benthos, these guys live on seafloor. So you'll find that the benthic environment is the seafloor, no matter what depth any part of the seafloor is the benthic environment. And so benthos are those animals that live on that seafloor. This word epi refers to on top. So epi means on top. So epifauna will live on top of the seafloor. So on rocks, on moving around like a crab, walking around on the seafloor. So you can either be mobile, which you're, 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 you can move obviously, whereas sessile is you're gonna be attached. You're gonna be attached to the seafloor, like a sea anemone or coral. Whereas uh, for epiflora, well, those are the marine algae, the seaweeds that are living on top. And then infauna refers to uh, live in substrate. So somehow you're living within that substrate. You're living within the mud, like worms, 